Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. As the manifestos start to be released, the election campaigns find a new gear. Today we are talking to a third candidate to be First Minister, Welsh Conservative Senate Group Leader Andrew R.T. Davis. Hello Andrew, thank you very much for coming on, talking to us. Um, come on, and uh, thank you for the kind invitation to come on and talk to you over this election period. Wonderful. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, this is your second Senate election as Welsh Conservative Group Leader. How does this election compare to the last? Well, obviously, COVID and COVID and COVID. <laughs> you know, it's dominated our lives over the last 12 months. Tragically, it's taken many people's lives from them and left other families obviously with life-changing uh, consequences because of COVID. And not unreasonably, people are challenging the candidates and the elected members, because obviously we haven't gone into dissolution yet, as to what the solutions they're going to put on the table once May the 6th and people have cast their votes. Are you a candidate that likes to get out and talk to people, though? Has that sort of put the, the kibosh on your usual uh, canvassing or communication routine? Well, I like to think I'm someone who does enjoy interacting with people in a physical sense, you know, being standing on the pavement, having a conversation with them or whether it's knocking on someone's door and they might dread the horror of a, another election candidate coming to their door and talking about politics. But I think that's the fuel that energises us as politicians, to be honest with you. And so like tonight, talking to yourself, Matthew, speaking to a little lens on the camera um, and being a distant away from you does seem rather bizarre and odd to me. But it's the way that we've had to adapt our lives over the last 12 months. Uh, and I'm sure it'll continue for the foreseeable future. But uh, thankfully, because of the success of the vaccination programme, we're seeing declining numbers of infection. And thankfully, we're seeing um, declining death rates across the UK and in particular here in Wales. And so hopefully there is light at the end of the tunnel for us all. Are you looking forward to getting out on uh, April 12th? Do you think it's the right decision to let people go and do door to door canvassing again? Well, I think from the evidence we've seen in other parts of the United Kingdom, because obviously other parts of the United Kingdom have been door-to-door -door canvassing because they have elections as well. Um, since, I believe, early March, I might be wrong on that, but sometime in March anyway, the restrictions were lifted in other parts of the United Kingdom. And I, I think, again, it's fair to say there's been a mixed response. And so I think candidates will judge their own areas because obviously we still have certain restrictions in place. Uh, some people obviously are very uh, cautious, shall we say, about how they conduct themselves in everyday lives now. So actually someone coming to the door and interacting with them face-to-face uh, -face might be a bit of a daunting prospect. For others, they generally do want to engage with would-be candidates, talk about the policies, talk about the issues, and look in the whites of the eyes of those candidates and decide whether they're the ones they want to give their confidence to for the next five years. So. I think it'll have to be a very localised decision rather than the uniform decision that's taken at a national level where everyone just hits the pavements, hits the door knockers. I think you'll have to determine what's suitable in your own area. Like I said, this is your second election as group leader. Do you think that you should have parity with your Scottish colleagues and be considered the leader of the Welsh Conservatives? Well, in all things that pertain to the Welsh Parliament, I am the leader, you know, from drafting the manifesto to having the final say of the manifesto to helping with selection of candidates to working with colleagues in Westminster then on areas that obviously aren't devolved responsibilities. And I do believe that we have great strength in being a proper Conservative and Unionist party that speaks both ends of the M4, one from a position of government and another from an election point of view where we want to be in government. Um, so, you know, I don't go into this election with a chip on the shoulder, thinking that we need greater parity with colleagues in Scotland. Scotland will do what they see is right for Scotland. Uh, I'm doing what I think is right for the Conservative and Unionist Party here in Wales. It must have come as a bit of a shock to you, though, to be leading this campaign now. A few months ago, you weren't leader of, uh, of the group, obviously, with Paul Davis resigning. So how easy was it for you to sort of kick back into that sort of feeling that you were about to lead a national uh, election campaign? Well, I think there's two things to consider here. The first one is, obviously, as a politician, you live for campaigns and you live for that interaction with the voter. But we've already talked about how difficult that is, that interaction with the COVID restrictions in place. But actually, this is the most exciting time for most politicians where you really do get stuck into the campaign and it sets the course for our nation over the next five years. So it's a once in a five year opportunity for people to have their say in politics. Moving that then into the realms of obviously leading the campaign, 
course, at the beginning of January, I wasn't looking to lead the campaign. I was quite happy doing my role as shadow health and social care spokesperson in the Conservative group, looking forward to taking the health and social care part of the manifesto forward, having those hustings meetings with Royal College of Nursing and all the other medical professional bodies. And lo and behold, because as Macmillan used to say, events, dear boy, events, uh, I ended up fronting the campaign and leading the campaign. So, you know, we are where we are. I'm excited by it. The candidates are excited by it. And fingers crossed, touch wood, as we go into the early stages of the campaign, things are looking well. Do you think that role as a shadow health and social care spokesperson has put you in a really good stead to, to fight an election which is going to be mainly on COVID response? Well, obviously, we've all been touched by COVID, whether you were fronting up the health and social care portfolio, whether you were the spokesperson in the economic portfolio, economic portfolio or whether you were doing the education or, or all aspects of our lives have been touched by it. So, you know, whether you're in politics, outside of politics, everyone has an opinion on what the response should be to COVID, what we need to do going forward. Um, what I think what really is important now is that we look forward to what we need to do post May the 6th the changes we need to make happen here in Wales to give people hope, give people opportunity, rather than navel-gazing on the constitution all the time, which some of the parties main offer in this election is talking more about constitutional change, rather than building a more positive vision of where we think Wales should be once we come out of this horrendous COVID virus. Do you mind if we talk a, uh, a little bit about some of your pledges? By all means. The, one of the ones that stands out is obviously the, the pledge to build the M4 relief road. Is, is, what does that say about your environmental uh, priorities, Andrew? Do, do you think that pledging to build more roads says that Conservatives don't care about the environment in Wales? No, I'm passionate about the environment. In my own personal life, the changes I've made to help my small carbon footprint, if you like, make a difference, as well as my business, which has changed dramatically over the years on the environment front, from planting trees to solar power, etc. Um, we've done transformational change in our own individual lives. Now in politics, I was the environment and agricultural and rural affairs spokesperson before I took on the health portfolio. Um, and I believe passionately that we need to hand over a better environment to the next generation than the one we've inherited and we have some real challenging goals we want to meet and I want to make sure we play our part as a country in leading the charge on those goals and hitting that carbon neutral target by 2050 and from an agricultural point of view we've committed as an industry to hitting that by 2040 uh, but when it comes to road building it's part of the overall transport objectives that we've set out in our manifesto uh, and our pledges in particular around electric charging points because it is a fact that we do need to revolutionize what our transport offer is to the general public because we know the carbon combustion engine is going to be phased out in the UK in a little over 10 to 15 years time so you can't sit still we need to invest in public transport our commitment to a metro here in South Wales and North Wales is vital to the development of sustainable transport options developing new road solutions as well part of the green agenda with electric charging points 20,000 charging points across the whole of Wales so that instead of us being caught in the tailgate of the revolution that's coming down on transport, we're leading that charge. We're not frightened to put our money where our mouths are and actually get on with the infrastructure projects that we think will do that. Because it's not just about the M4, it's about the A40, it's about the A55. You can't stand still. And we believe in that offer to the constituents in those parts of Wales, we'll be turbocharging the economy across the whole of Wales. So let's talk about turbocharging the economy. We're talking about jobs as well. So again, you've promised 65,000 new jobs. Where do you see the growth sectors being? Where do you see those jobs coming from? Well, the green energy sector is an exciting and dynamic field that we know will be expanding dramatically over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and that's all about remodeling the economy. And of the 65,000 jobs, 15,000 would be dedicated green energy jobs. And we know Wales has huge potential in that area. So linking in with the research and technology side of it, because sadly, very often we're putting other people's technology in the field and deploying it in the field rather than developing it here and developing the wealth opportunities that that could build here in Wales. So we believe that that's where the growth area is going to come in green technology. But also, we know for a fact that 50 odd thousand jobs plus have been lost to the COVID crisis. And we need to reinstate those jobs back into the real economy of Wales, but not just reinstate them, make sure that we get quality jobs which pay decent wages. 
And if you to go back to the start of devolution in 1999, Scotland, for example, and Wales had parity when it came to take home wages. Today, Scotland, a Scottish worker takes home £55 a week more than a Welsh worker. Against an English worker, that's about £52, £53 a week. Can you imagine the difference that would make in the real economy of Wales by increasing take-home pay across Wales by putting quality jobs with decent prospects in place? And that's what our commitment is when we say we want to create 65,000 jobs in Wales. You talk about the economy sort of reopening. Is there, is there a chance that any party could ride the wave back up the, as the economy grows to say they're going to deliver uh, 65,000 new jobs or 50,000 new jobs, as you, as you say, about the ones that have been lost so far due to coronavirus restrictions? No, I don't think so, because obviously we've seen from the nationalist side of things that they want to focus on referendum on independence. And that, as we've seen with previous referendums, is hugely debilitating on governments. It saps them of energy, saps them of ideas. And then on the other side of the argument, those who want to do away with the Welsh Parliament, they too would have to focus on a referendum as well, they would. What we're offering is, rather than constitutional navel-gazing, our focus will be on rebuilding our great public services, getting the economy going full throttle to pick up the pandemic uh, debris that has been left behind by the shutdown, the, the total shutdown in some aspects of the economy for at least 12, maybe 18 months. Uh, and so there's a huge job of work to do rather than be distracted into the realms of constitutional change all the time. And what we've seen with Labour over the last 22 years is just berating the lack of powers, the lack of money. The one thing Labour stand for, lack of ideas when it comes to turbocharging our economy and turbocharging Wales. And it's that lack of ideas that the public need to consider when they're casting their vote as early as next week, because obviously postal votes will be starting to land as of next week. There must be some areas you'd like more powers, though, for the Senate. Any sort of tax powers that you'd like to maybe have that you could turbocharge the economy that way? I think you've talked about uh, paying the difference on VAT. Would you not like to be able to set that power, set that rate yourself? No, because we can do that already. We can do that by obviously reimbursing businesses who've had to pay VAT. Hence, us we can make our commitment to keep VAT for the next 12 months if, if we're the government. Uh, at 5% in the hospitality and tourism sector. That's an important part of allowing those companies to rebuild. As I said, I've just been in West Wales today, talking to several businesses down there who have had their reserves completely depleted um, by obviously the closure of their businesses over the last 12 months. Now they're looking forward with excitement to the summer prospects of having record number of staycation visitors, but that might not be enough to carry them through the winter months as well. So we have the powers to do that by economic levers at the moment available to an incoming government in Walesshire. Um, and don't forget the Welsh Parliament that will convene in early May will be the most powerful parliament that has ever convened in Wales uh, with a mandate of the Brexit powers that have come back from Brussels of 70 odd new fields of responsibility, as well as the changes that have happened over the last 10 years of the full constitutional legislative proposals that were passed by referendum in 2011, and the two Wales bills that transferred whole swathes of responsibility on taxation and other constitutional areas that the Welsh Parliament, when it first was considered in 99, couldn't even dream of. Why have you not decided to offer people a cut in their income tax? That seems like, uh, you know, fruitful ground for a Conservative Party to, to operate in. Well, I'm instinctively a low tax conservative, and I do believe that the levers around taxation incentivize people to obviously work harder and ultimately in the medium to long term generate more wealth for the country because obviously the economy does expand. But in our pledges, we've committed where we can help. We will help on council tax, for example, that has risen over 200% since 1999 year in Wales. Uh, and has seen massive increases this year and every year that Labour have been in since 2016. So that's one way we can help with cost of living pressures. We've also talked about putting money into national insurance holidays uh, for new workers being taken on. Uh, and we've also talked about other areas of the economic impact we'd like to make for businesses, such as vet VAT relief uh, for the hospitality and tourism sector that would be directly into a sector that has been dramatically affected by the pandemic. So we're using the tools in the early part of the, uh, of the parliamentary term to make an immediate impact. Tax cuts maybe would be something that would be more medium to longer term aspiration. But at the moment, we believe that the economy needs immediate assistance and cost of living pressures require immediate intervention, such as obviously council tax freezing for two years. 
So, so on council tax freezing, obviously local government across the UK has been under huge pressures in the last few years. How would you intend to supplement the budget shortfall for local authorities if they are not in a position to increase their council tax rates for, for, for the period of two years? Well, we've, we've done our proposals around a 2.5% increase for the councils funded from the Welsh Government. So it's not saying that councils would have to have a standstill budget. Um, that would have cost approximately 80 to 90 million pounds, it would then. Um, and that would be per year, obviously, for the two years of the freeze. Hence, that would be a direct impact on cost of living pressures that people are facing, but an affordable measure that we could take to assist families across Wales, whilst making sure local authorities would have assistance in managing their budgets. But it is a fact that the councils have had generous settlements in recent years, uh, because Welsh Labour have chosen to stand back and allow councils to put above cost of living increases into their budget proposals that have been adopted in county halls the length and breadth of Wales. Let's not forget CPR this year is a 0.7 of 1%. You know, that, that is what people are living on. That's the increase that people are seeing uh, in real inflation, 0.7%. And yet many councils have put in four, five, six percent increases. Plus you put the Police and Crime Commission precip raises that have gone in as well. That to me just seems to be the way government needs to be assisting family budgets and household budgets and take the pressure out of the system. Would you ever be in favour of local government reorganisation? 22 councils seems like an awful lot for a country the size of Wales, isn't it? Money could be saved there. Would that not be a good place to start? Well, big isn't always beautiful, as we've seen with the proposals around the health service when the government restructured the health service for the second time within 10 years back in 2009, because we had the Jane Hutt proposals in the early noughties that were supposed to set the health service here in Wales on its track uh, for a generation or two. And within five or six years, Edwina Hart totally remodelled it again, creating, instead of 22 health boards, they created seven, they did then. Uh, and as we've seen with the well-documented interventions in Betsy up in the north, which is one of the biggest public sector bodies anywhere you'll find in the UK, which was in special measures for five years plus, one of the longest periods of special measures. As I said, big is not always beautiful. And it's creating that partnership between Welsh government and local authorities that they can coexist together. And above all, what we need to be considering is that the anoraks in the world always focus on constitutional change between parliaments. But actually, what about devolving responsibilities out from Cardiff Bay to local authorities that give them a greater say on economic development, for example, which is an area that many local authorities have unique specialities in their own areas. While we're on the, the health topic, let's go to Betsy. What would you do uh, sort of day one in government to sort out Betsy Carroll and a health board? Well, Betsy at the moment does have a new chief executive, but we've seen several chief executives come and go through a Betsy Health Board um, management structure. What we want to do is commission a review into, this, into the way Betsy operates and make sure that that review delivers within the first 100 days of a Welsh Conservative government. I think actually just talking of complete reorganisation could well be a distraction for what the Health Board actually requires. And what it requires is good, solid management where the staff will work diligently on the front line, whether that be medical staff, whether that be the domestic staff within the hospitals, or whether that be anyone working in the community, have confidence that what is being promised is deliverable for the patients, whether they're in Wrexham, Bangor or Hollyhead. And at the moment, there seems to be a disconnect between the ward and the management. And that needs to be bridged so that ultimately you have a health board that's delivering for patients, whether you're, as I said, you're in Wrexham, whether you're in Bangor or you're in Hollyhead. And the well-documented casualties in all this are the staff and patients who ultimately have had to suffer years and years of neglect and spiralling waiting time. That just cannot go on, will not go on, and ultimately reinforces why you need to change after 22 years of Labour running the show into putting a new, vibrant government that has a vision for where the future will be post May the 6th. All you'll do if you put the same management back in after May the 6th, will have the same problems and no, no solutions put in place. On health, you've talked about building more hospitals. Where do you think you want them to, to go? And what is your plan to, to fund these hospitals? 
Well, it's about developing community infrastructure because um, community hospitals play a vital role between the bridge of the district general hospital and obviously getting people back into the community, back into their own homes as such. And very often there's not that transition. Now we've identified Newtown, we've identified Flint, for example, we've identified uh, Langdon and Wells Hospital, and there would be five redevelopments in total there would be to create that bridge so that we create that community capacity so that we can get into some of these wait, horrendous waiting times that we face here in Wales, rather than have wards backed up in the district general hospitals. So it's about creating capacity along with investing in the 1200 doctors. By the end of the five year period, obviously 3000 new nurses, so that instead of having one in five waiting on a waiting list here in Wales, which are the worst waiting times anywhere in the United Kingdom, we do make progress and actually we reverse the expansion of waited times and we start seeing a decrease. Because I think actually when you look back at COVID, one of the fairest criticisms you can level against the Welsh Government, the current Welsh Labour Government, is that they didn't reopen the health service back last summer to start making progress into general waiting times and elective surgeries like other parts of the United Kingdom did. And that's why we face this massive problem of dealing with the waiting time backlog that we see in all parts of Wales. Whilst we're on the, the pandemic response then, how do you think uh, the Welsh Government has handled uh, the pandemic response? Well, as I said, the, the real tragedy, especially when it comes to the health service, is, is this inability for Welsh Government to get the health service back up and running when pressure was off back last summer and start eating into those elective surgery times and, and waiting lists that were growing exponentially right the way through and continue to grow right up until the present day uh, with one in five people on a waiting list. I think we, we, we've got to reflect on the early part of the pandemic in particular uh, and where the Welsh Government had a joined up message and a joined up approach with other nations of the United Kingdom. Again, building on my experience of my visit to West Wales, that was a point that was coming over time and time again with messaging and the way people understood what was expected of them. And I think we can point to some notable successes in credit to the government's approach in the early part of the pandemic. But from midsummer onwards, it did start to lose its way. And certainly in the autumn, in the depth of winter, I think we're all over the place in a lot of the work that it was undertaking and some of the announcements it was taking and the actions it was taking. But one thing throughout this crisis we must always reflect on is the huge, huge effort of frontline workers, the charities, and indeed the Welsh public in the community who have put their shoulder to the wheel in solidarity and faced down this horrendous virus, whether they be in a hospital setting, a community setting or just doing that errand to the local supermarket to get some provisions for someone who's self-isolating it really has shown Wales at its best that has and I think that is just something that we could take huge pride from in, in looking at the response of Wales as a country to what is what we've faced over this horrendous last 12 months. We'll, we'll move on from health then and um, I want to look at one of your other uh, pledges which is that you say you want to invest more in policing but you also say you don't want to spend any money in non-devolved areas. How do you reconcile this pledge with that earlier promise? Well, I feel you've been taken in by the Labour propaganda on this one, you have, because um, obviously <laughs> community projects and community support is very much something that is in the devolved sphere of influence. And we would be looking to invest in community support and community support officers, because we see that as a vital role in working with the police service and the criminal justice service. Actually, we want to keep people out of the criminal justice system uh, because we know full well that the outcomes when people do enter into the criminal justice system and in particular prison aren't good and the reoffending rates are appalling. And so it's about building that partnership approach and working where we can with the police service, which isn't a devolved responsibility. There's going to be enough big ticket items for a Welsh government to deal with rather than this constant call from whether it be the Labour Party or Plaid Cymru or the Liberals to transfer police and criminal justice to the Welsh Parliament. The Silk Commission, for example, when it looked at criminal, the criminal justice system and policing, if it was to be transferred, and bear in mind the Silk Commission's evidence now is some 10 years old nearly, that cost would be about £100 million. Do so people seriously think that that's money that would be well spent and have improved outcomes as well as the political energy that would be required to incorporate that into the responsibilities of the Welsh Parliament. I don't think it would be. That's why we believe that there's a partnership to be built here. There's an investment that can be made in community support and community infrastructure. And that's where the energies of a future Welsh Conservative government would be dedicated to, to, to looking at. 
obviously the Conservatives have never been in government here in Wales, but they are in government of Westminster. How close do you think you would be to your Conservative colleagues in Westminster? Do you think that you would be able to create a uniquely Welsh Conservative policy approach, or do you think that you would end up following a lot of uh, the Conservative decisions in, in the UK government? Well, I think I've proven when I was leader first time round, shall we say, between 2011 and 2018, that where I thought there were better solutions to be found here in Wales for issues that were Welsh specific, we would we would explore and and adopt those policies. And sadly, we were never in a position to govern at that time, but we would have implemented them with the manifestos and the policy positions we took we, we took at the time. So I'm not someone who people can say you will just do as you're told. I think most people would know full well that I'm someone who will give it both barrels when it's required. And if you take income tax powers as a point, a case in point here, uh, it was very much UK government policy to try and instigate the lockstep uh, when transferring those powers. Don't forget, I sacked four members of my shadow cabinet because they disagreed with me over that. Uh, and now we have income tax powers, which I think is critical to accountability and responsibility with no lockstep. But I do not believe that you should just have a political punch up for the sake of the political punch up. Uh, and I do think that when you look at the Welsh Labour Party and some of the battles they fought to, to have with Westminster, it's more out of political ideology than what's good and best for Wales. And I believe that with a Welsh Conservative government after May the 6th, we could build a sensible, reliable coalition of ideas with two governments of like-minded thinking at both ends of the M4 for the benefit of Wales coming out of the COVID crisis. And that's why I go back to saying time and time again, we would focus on the bread and butter issues rather than focusing on the constitutional change and constitutional turmoil that the other parties talk of either in home rule or an independence referendum. When I'm going around talking to people, no one is mentioning that to me whatsoever. Obviously, it's not your, your desired outcome, but uh, would there be sufficient common ground between you and any other party in Wales that could form the basis of a coalition agreement? Well, we're not measuring the curtains in Cate's Park with anyone else, uh, although I notice the other parties are very much focused on talking about coalition and talking about what they want to do together uh, after May the 6th. What I do know is that in 2019, 550 odd thousand people voted Welsh Conservative um, in the general election of that year. If 75% of that 550 odd thousand voted uh, Welsh Conservative on May the 6th, that would be a bigger number than any party has achieved to be the largest party going into the uh, Welsh parliamentary term, the five year parliamentary term that we would have of the sixth, assembly, of sixth parliament. So we're just focused on taking our message to the people of Wales, having those conversations, talking about the economy, talking about investing in our health service, talking about revitalising our education system, our environmental credentials, what we want to do for transport and a whole host of other ideas. Uh, it'll be for the people to decide who they want to govern them. Uh, and I do think that it is unfortunate, shall I say, which is a diplomatic word, to be listening so much to the other party leaders talking about cosy consensuses and coalitions that they're trying to forge uh, because it should be the people at the ballot box determine how Wales will be governed over the next five years. Obviously, in 2007, Plaid Cymru and the Conservatives nearly came to a coalition deal. You have, this time round, ruled out any coalition deal with Plaid Cymru. What's changed between 2007 and 2021, obviously, apart from a bit of time? What's the no, fundamental no, I, differences between the parties now that there wasn't before? I think there's two very clear things here. The one is making that announcement prior to the election so people know if they vote Welsh Conservative, they will get a Welsh Conservative member of the Senate who will vote for Welsh Conservative policies because we've just come out of a parliamentary term which has seen some members of the Senate, you know, change parties four or five times from the time that they were elected in 2016, a clearly ridiculous situation to be in. Uh, so I think it's important that voters have confidence when they go to the ballot box and they look at the names on that piece of paper that they are voting for a Welsh Conservative and a Welsh Conservative candidate will carry out Welsh Conservative policies. The second is obviously Adam Price's insistence about an independence referendum within the first term of a Senate parliamentary term, which I appreciate from a nationalist point of view is what they would say. Um, and if that's what he wants and that's what floats his boat, good luck to him. 
but as a Welsh Conservative and Unionist, I'm passionate about the Union and I will do all I can to stem the flow of independence and stop it and make sure that we increase the strength, deepen the root of the Union, because I think Wales is served well by the Union and the Union is served well by Wales. It's a partnership at the end of the day and it's a partnership that stood Wales in very good stead. Paul Davis, your, your predecessor, did say that he wanted to stay with, he wanted to reduce the size of government so there would only be seven ministers in his government. Is that a pledge you are going to stick to if you are elected? No, the, the government at the end of the day will reflect the dynamics of what it looks like after May the 6th to May the 7th. I've got to remember May the 7th because obviously that's actually when the count is happening. There's no overnight counting this time around, there's not. Uh, normally the dynamics of the post-election makeup come quite clear in the early hours of, of the Friday morning, but it could well be maybe even into the Saturday with the proportional representation system we've got before the dynamics come clear. I'm focused on putting a Welsh Conservative government together. If the people give us their confidence, like the, like the manifesto, like the pledges that we've put forward, uh, that will best face down the COVID virus that we've had for 12 months and build the recovery that we need Wales to be enjoying when we come out of this crisis. And I believe that the Welsh Conservatives with the policies we have will be the best party place to do that, but it'll be for the electorate to determine that. One thing we're very clear on is that in the entire five year period, we will not vote for increasing more politicians in Cardiff Bay. And we're very clear on that. We don't believe that there should be any more than the 60 MSs who would be returned uh, by the electorate on May the 6th, May the 7th of this year for the full five year period. And we're not like the other parties measuring up the curtains in Gatay's Park, which is going on as we speak between Labour and the Nationalists. If you want to face down that Nationalist threat, if you want to face down the 22 years of Labour failure, there's only one vote you need to cast, and that's for the Welsh Conservatives. And people did that in 2019, as I've explained a little earlier, with 550-odd thousand voters voting for the Welsh Conservatives from North Wales, Mid Wales, West Wales and South Wales, across the whole of Wales that happened. I, you will forgive me, and I, it would be remiss of me not to ask this, as a, just as a follow-up. So if the voters of Wales decided that between the Welsh Conservatives and, say, abolish the Assembly, there were enough uh, members of the Senate to elect you to be First Minister and, and to, to form a government, you, you, you wouldn't rule that out? No, I've said we're not forming coalitions. I, I, I abolish Liberals, Greens, uh, Plaid Cymru, Labour. I, I will go on if I can, but uh, I'm running out of political parties. I'm not quite... It's, it's almost as if, if Andrew Arthur Davis doesn't name a party, oh, he's going into coalition with them. We are not forming a coalition. We are not in Cate's Park measuring the curtains. We are standing as Welsh Conservative and Unionist candidates across the length and breadth of Wales, both regionally and constituency. We're putting our pledges, which we've done some three weeks ago now. We'll be doing our manifesto in 10 days time, I think it is, on the 14th. Uh, and the voters, as of next week, will be having postal votes land on their doormats. And the ballot box will open up for votes to be received on May the 6th. That's the battlefield. That is where voters will decide who they want to go back and represent them in the Welsh parliamentary session that will be the sixth session of the Welsh Assembly. Thank you for humouring me, Andrew. You understood no that I had to ask. <laughs> OK, look at, looking, looking forward again, I see you, you've laid out what you think is, is necessary to, 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 to deal with the future. But in the, in the immediacy, in the next five years, what do you think are the major challenges that will face Wales? Obviously, you've, you've outlined a lot to deal with coronavirus response. But apart from that, what do you think are the major challenges that will face Wales in the next five years? And why do you think that you are the right person to take them on? Well, I don't think you can divorce what we've talked about earlier because they are the major challenges about getting our economy up and running again after the COVID crisis, making sure businesses have the opportunity to create those jobs because without jobs, we don't get revenue to fund the public services. And the public services will need a complete injection of capital and energy so that we can, when we take health, for example, start tackling these horrendous waiting times that are across the whole of Wales. It's not just in North Wales, Mid Wales, West Wales or South Wales. Now, one in five, 20 percent of the population are on a waiting list. They're not in the hospital. They're not in having surgery. They're on a waiting list waiting to get in there. And we know after the dedication and commitment our health workers have made over the last 12 months that they're exhausted. So that energy of the government needs to be focused on 
building up our staff levels, making sure our staff feel loved and cared for within the environment so that they can get on with the job of alleviating the pain and suffering that people have on those waiting times. Meeting our big climate goal, climate change goals, uh, and developing an environment that is a better environment for the next generation that we pass on to. Making sure education achieves for all children, wherever they are in Wales. And I'm dyslexic, for example, but I know full well what it is to make sure that every child feels that opportunity, whether that be vocational or academic. And turbocharging our transport system to make sure that we have the transport infrastructure in place that connects all of Wales and doesn't leave parts of Wales back as isolation black spots and not creating the employment opportunities that businesses look for and say, that's where we want to locate our premises, that's where we want to grow our businesses and ultimately leave communities behind. That's why in trans investment in transport is going to be so critical over the next decade. And with the leveling up fund and the shared prosperity fund, there is that opportunity to do it on a UK basis. And the other commitment I will be making quite clearly, and I've made it loud and clear, we won't be talking about the constitution and navel gazing about independence or home rule or abolish. We'll be focused on what makes a difference in everyday lives of people. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. That was the third episode in our Race to be First Minister series. Uh, if you haven't listened to them yet, please go back and hear our interviews with current First Minister and Welsh Labour leader Mark Drakeford and Plaid Cymru leader Adam Price. And if you like what you've heard so far today, please don't forget to find us on Medium at Here Right Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here Right Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here Right Blog. Thank you for listening to Here Right. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.